Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. So if you ask a Republican why they think Glenn Youngkin performed well on Tuesday in Virginia, you'll likely hear a very common refrain. Glenn Youngkin never ran before, is only listening to the parents. And you have Youngkin giving an optimistic vision for the future. I think you had Glenn Youngkin, who really, I think, did a great job, was a great candidate, and I think he really represented a contrasting vision that was much more appealing. I felt like we ran a positive campaign that was, that was expressing a vision for the future. You heard him there. Glenn Youngkin won because he was able to lay out a vision for America's future. And even if that vision is to whitewash our education and ignore the effects of racism in America, pundits all over will tell you it allowed Republicans to mobilize their base in a way that Democrats just didn't. But here's the thing. President Biden has actually been quite vocal about his vision for America. And he says it damn near every day. Build back better. Alliteration is very helpful here. It's a vision in which women can go to work and afford childcare. A vision in which older Americans don't have to go bankrupt to get home care. A vision that ensures future generations will have a planet to live on by investing in climate initiatives. It's a vision that seems pretty clear to me. But what happens when your attempts to bring those visions to life get blocked by members of your own party? Take the example of paid leave. America is the only rich country on earth without a national paid leave program. So it makes sense that House Democrats are making a latch ditch effort to put it back into Biden's Build Back Better Act. But one senator is against it, against it. And in an interview with CNN, he revealed why he seems to be the constant barrier, obstacle to Joe Biden's vision. We can't go too far left. This is not a center left or a left country. We are a center, if anything, a little center right country, and it's being, that's being shown. And we ought to be able to recognize that. Yep, Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Manchin, excuse me, doesn't want it to go too big with this bill because America is a center right country. That's what Joe Manchin thinks. And if that's true, this center-right country sure does love a lot of policies included in this package. 78% of American voters support expanding Medicare coverage. 60% of American voters support funding child care and universal pre-K. 70% of American voters support a paid leave program. And Joe Manchin isn't the only Democratic lawmaker who seems to think the party should abandon their vision of transformational change despite how popular that vision is with the American people. Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger of Virginia told the New York Times that Biden is doing too much. Nobody elected him to be FDR, she said. They elected him to be normal and stop the chaos. Well, President Franklin Roosevelt, of course, spearheaded the New Deal during the Great Depression, and the policies he's got, he got through were so popular that they allowed Democrats to maintain control of Congress basically uninterrupted for 60 years. So turns out helping the country and the people in it is a very popular thing. Helping working families is popular. That's the kind of thing Joe Biden is trying to do. That's the transformational vision he's trying to implement. Or he could go for less. I suppose the campaign slogan would go something like, vote for me, I got you less inspirational. Joining me now, MSNBC political analyst Juanita Tolliver and Kristen Myers, editor-in-chief of The Balance. Juanita, I'll start with you. Since when is do less a popular political strategy? It is, Zerlina, if anything. They're like, do what you promise, right? Like, Build Back Better was what Biden said day in and day out on the campaign trail. His campaign displayed a level of message discipline I don't think we usually get to see. But Build Back Better was the theme. Now it's time to deliver on that. And you have folks like Manchin standing in the way. And I think Manchin even went so far as today to say that he wants this to be a standalone bipartisan bill. And I'm like, we got to start asking ourselves why he not only obstructs this, but demands something that he has not been able to deliver, as in 10 GOP senators to stand for substantive legislation, right? Like, he time and time again keeps doing this. And honestly, if he he's standing firm on this, 
he needs to come to the table with free approved provisions that could be included in said bipartisan bill, as well as the names of 10 Republican senators who are ready to go public with him. Because in my mind, in the rest of the world's mind, when I see Republicans filibustering voting rights, filibustering significant pieces of legislation that'll help people every single day, I'm like, they don't exist. And Joe Manchin is clinging to this artificial requirements of, of bipartisanship in a moment when he should stand in power with Democrats and deliver for the American public. Because looking back at Tuesday, no voter would say do less. If anything, every voter is saying do more and deliver. And so that is what needs to happen. And, so, and Manchin needs to fall in line because when Speaker Pelosi throws this gauntlet down, what she's communicating is, look, I'm fighting for Americans. I'm listening to what families need. I'm listening to what women need. And now Manchin needs to come up with a better excuse than this isn't the vehicle for, for paid family leave when Democrats have control of it. I always find it interesting when men don't find it very urgent to tackle problems that um, women and families um, experience, like child care uh, and universal pre-K and home care. All of that usually, I mean, the stats prove this through the pandemic. This is falling on women's shoulders. And so maybe he doesn't feel the urgency because it's not really real for him. Kristen, I want to play you what Joe Manchin said today on MSNBC regarding Biden's Build Back Better agenda. The only thing I would say is the rush to this, and I've said this long before, I truly believe that we need to slow down. I truly believe that we need to wait and see if inflation is transitory, see how much worse it may get. Hopefully it doesn't. To that point about urgency, didn't Virginia teach Democrats they don't have time to wait? Well, I mean, it's a little bit hilarious to say that we shouldn't rush to do this because the United States hasn't rushed to pass really any sort of paid maternity leave at all. As you mentioned in the open, we are the only developed Western nation that doesn't offer this type of benefit. I decided to go and just look at some of the research and see where we are on a global scale. Out of 41 countries, we are dead last. Estonia offering 20 months of maternity leave for women. I mean, I don't know how much slower we can go than last place, frankly, Zerlina. So I don't understand what kind of uh, speed uh, Senator Manchin thinks that we need to be going. but. The fact is this, we hear moderate Democrats, we hear Republicans, we hear them all talking about how the family is the backbone of the United States. Everything that is done needs to be done to preserve the family. Well, contrary to popular belief, moms can't do it all. They need help. There is a reason that we say it takes a village to raise a child. And frankly, we need social programs to help moms and frankly, also to help dads. I mean, they're, they're also a part of this equation. They're parents too. We need help for parents to essentially raise their children and to essentially strengthen that backbone of the United States. I think there is a reason that every other nation, uh, well, not every other, there's only five other countries that are joining us in this list, not offering any kind of leave here. I don't think we wanna be uh, a part of that six anymore, but there's a reason that most of our counterparts offer this type of benefit. And it's not because they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. It's because they realize it is better for society and it's better financially and economically if we are enable women to essentially take time to heal physically, take time to heal mentally, bond with their child, and then eventually get back to the workforce. I do really quickly want to you know, tackle that comment on, on inflation being transitory. I think it's a little bit laughable because, frankly, helping people get back to work uh, and decreasing some of those labor shortages that we are seeing enable workers to get back to those factories to produce those goods, get back stocking those shelves, moving the goods across the country and those trucks, that's actually going to help bring inflation down. So if we if we really want to make sure that we, we make sure that inflation is transitory, aka temporary, then we want to start passing provisions that are going to help women uh, and, and dads essentially get back into the workforce. I mean, one of the things that we have to keep in mind, which is strange that we we're not even bringing it up in this moment is the pandemic the backdrop of this is the pandemic i think that's why the fdr comparison is helpful because he was coming um at you know during the great depression joe biden is coming in during the worst economic crisis um as a result of a, a global pandemic that no one's lived through before um do you think the moderates realize juanita that these ideas have majority support 
and and folks need this in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, frankly, the idea that women can just stay home and take care of kids, it belies the facts of 2021, which is that often women are the breadwinners or you need two incomes in a household to be able to manage all of the things that you need for your family. So the idea that women can just stay home because they're Betty Draper from 1955 is also um, a problem. But but speak to the idea that the pandemic is the backdrop of, of all of this policy discussion uh, that Joe Manchin doesn't seem really urgent uh, to solve. Context is everything, Zerlina, right? Since the start of this pandemic through, I think even September of 2020, millions of women had left the workforce because they just couldn't balance work. They couldn't balance the care of their family. And that's not just children, that's elder relatives and loved ones as well. And they could not do it all. I, I think I think what we need to center ourselves on is the fact that as women were disproportionately harmed, they're going to need the most support. So when you see that number of 70% of the general public, and that's across partisan lines, 70% mm -hmm. of the general public supports paid family leave, it's because they need it. And when you are looking to the 2022 midterms, you want to say to voters, we delivered on what you need. This is not some random spending spree like Manchin and others try to paint it out to be. This is responding to needs based on disproportionate um, issues that were exasperated during this pandemic. Because let's be real, paid family leave has been an issue for a long time. And Democrats have been running on a promise to deliver it for decades. And so now it's time to follow through on that. And I think uh, what Manchin is, is he, I think he recognizes that and that's why he's calling for a bipartisan bill. But the reality is that you can deliver this right now with Democrats as long as you can reach an agreement and stop playing these games as though you don't see the harm that this pandemic has done as if you don't see the issues that it has exacerbated. Kristen, what's your dog's name? <laughs> His name is Titan, and he uh, he also supports paid family leave, I should say, because he knows that uh, it is so desperately a, needed he, in this country. <laughs> He's very passionate about these issues. Um, but about paid family leave, do you think it's, if it doesn't get included in the final package here, is it realistic to do it in a standalone bill? That's what Joe Manchin thinks, Kristen. Do you think that's that's realistic? I mean, I don't actually know. I don't understand the reason to necessarily strip it out. It seems as if Senator Manchin is doing everything to essentially reduce costs. So, I mean, let's talk about that. Paid family leave when it was 12 weeks, not the, the paltry four weeks that we have now as a part of this, you know, adding back into this framework. When it was 12 weeks, it was over 200 billion over the next decade. So, you know, divide that by three and you get the figure that it's going to cost over the next decade. I mean, it's really, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, not the most expensive piece of legislation that we have ever seen. And we've already scaled back this spending bill from over $3 trillion now down to $1.5 trillion. So to take this particular proposal and strip it out, and what he's essentially saying is, you know, I actually do support paid family leave. I just don't support it uh, tacking on these extra dollars to help mothers, uh, to help uh, uh, women and men take care of their parents, take care of their children, get back to work. We're going to put it in a standalone bill. I don't know the success of that. It's clear that it is broadly popular across both parties and with all Americans. And again, the reason is because the families have been struggling, essentially, when they do bring a child into this world. They've been struggling when their parent became ill or became sick or when their spouse became ill and sick. And I think Juanita's point here is very well taken. The pandemic did not cause these problems, it exacerbated them. We actually have to start asking ourselves, what would the past year and a half, nearly two years now have looked like if some of these programs were actually already in place? What would our country mm. look like right now if women had already been given the ability to take care of their children when they were sick? to stay home with their children when they were newly born. If, you know, people, children were able to take care of their parents when they became ill, for, for example, with perhaps COVID, you know, for a couple of months, if they were able to go out on leave to bereave their, their dead loved ones, 
what would our country have looked like over the last year and a half? I really think that's the question we really need to start asking ourselves. And I think if we start coming to terms with the fact that perhaps this last year and a half would have looked entirely different if we had provided some of these safety nets, then maybe we would be a little bit more supportive uh, so that we can make sure that we are giving folks this kind of support and this kind of help so that, God forbid, we do have another catastrophic event like the pandemic or yeah. at least another economic shock uh, that folks, that families will be able to weather that kind of storm. Because right now, we, as we've seen, they are not able to at all. It's such an important point. I'm so glad that you included that. And, and Juanita, what's the political cost of, of not feeling the sense of urgency that families clearly feel? And at Kristen's point, I think she's right. I think this, this last year and a half would have looked very different if these social programs were in place to support families. And that's the reason they want them. They're like, we need this stuff. This is an emergency. Yes, I think politically, if Tuesday was a warning shot, <laughs> then going into the midterms, then we can expect Democrats to use everything they have to get this done because we know that families not only want to see Democrats fighting for them, but delivering for them because the midterms are all going to be about what have you done for me lately? How have you improved my life? How am I living differently than I was at the start of this pandemic or even before the pandemic? Show me your worth because even though Abigail Spanberger said that people elected Biden to end the chaos that they had under Trump administration, they also elected him to deliver and improve the conditions that they were living in. And so that is the political impact here, because failure to deliver will speak to failure at the ballot box and at the polls in 2022. Juanita Tolliver, Krista Myers, thank you both for starting us off tonight on this Thursday night. Please stay safe. Coming up. A deadline is set for President Biden's vaccine mandate for the private sector. We'll discuss that next. Today, the Biden administration put out new details on the vaccine mandate for private employers. Under the new rules released by OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, companies with 100 or more employees will have to ensure their workforce is fully vaccinated by January the 4th. Unvaccinated workers who opt out of the requirement will have to get tested every single week and wear a mask in the workplace. The White House says this mandate will cover 84 million workers nationwide. Today, the nation's top health experts testified on the Hill about the importance of taking this step. Here's how Dr. Anthony Fauci explained it. Let me just explain very briefly. We know that vaccines absolutely save lives. And we know that mandates work. If you look at, for example, the percentage of people in United Airlines or in the Houston Medical Association or in other organizations that have mandated, it works 99 plus percent, for example, with United Airlines. So if you take the fact that mandates work and vaccines absolutely save lives, the answer to your question is yes, it does save lives. It seems like sound logic, right? Well, not to Republican lawmakers. Senator Mike Braun of Indiana is teaming up with 40 GOP senators to try and use congressional, the Congressional Review Act to block Biden's mandate. Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs introduced legislation that would get rid of OSHA altogether. And at the state level, a whole bunch of Republican lawmakers are suing. One of them is Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves. He called the mandates one of the most shocking attacks on personal liberty we have seen in this country during my lifetime. And, you know, that's a real change of tune from Tate Reeves. The Mississippi Free Press points out that in 2015, when Reeves was lieutenant governor and president of the state Senate, he presided over the passage of a bill that would have locked up tuberculosis patients who refused treatment. Mississippi is just one of several Republican-led states to announce legal action. Ohio, Missouri, and Florida are right there with them. And joining me now to discuss is Dr. Erwin Redliner. He's co-founder of the Children's Health Fund and an NBC News public health analyst. And Dr. Redliner, from the public health standpoint, how, how do we get to this place where states are suing over vaccine mandates? Well, this is completely 
nuts. You know, we keep thinking that it can't get any worse. It can't get any more ignorant uh, in terms of what is being propo proposed or suggested by Republican lawmakers. And, uh, you know, all I keep thinking about is, and I wrote an op-ed about this, that President Bolsonaro of Brazil is being uh, held on uh, human rights violations and criminal negligence. He's the president of Brazil because of policies that resulted in excess uh, deaths from COVID. And, and my question was, why aren't we holding our lawmakers and especially governors who control state policies up for the same level of accountability? It is so preposterous that we have grown up legislators uh, either suing the federal government or demanding that we not have uh, mandates and so on. It is so contrary Zerlina, to science and to what needs to be done to save lives. You know, we have three quarters of a million Americans now who have died of uh, COVID, and at least 80% of those were avoidable deaths. If we had been vaccinated, we wouldn't be in this very tragic situation that we're in now, Zerlina. I think when you think about the avoidable deaths, that's when I, I get very upset because, you know, when we didn't have a vaccine, you know, that's one thing. But once we had the vaccine, the politicization of vaccines has cost lives. Um, but I'm glad to see, you know, there is now evidence of vaccine mandates working. You see, you, you heard Dr. Fauci there. Elaborate on what he said there. Why do they work? Like, what's the science to back that up? To back up refusing to believe the truth? Uh, oh, no, there, that, there is no that, why, there why is are no. the vaccine mandates working? Well, they're working because people want to go to work, they want to go to events, they want to eat inside restaurants, uh, they want to keep their jobs, basically. And the more we can say that you can't come to work here, uh, because the federal government outlaws it. If, if you work for a company with more than 100 people, you will not be able to come to work unless you get vaccinated. Uh, and some, of the, some companies will have an option of allowing people to get tested once a week, but the 17 million uh, healthcare workers don't even have that option, nor should they. You've got to get vaccinated, period. And I think, uh, I just think this is something that we're going to need to enforce. And when we do enforce it, we'll finally get to... Uh, the vaccination levels that will help protect at least some of the uh, spread of this uh, really vicious, lethal COVID-19 virus. So we're post Halloween, we're heading into Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. Um, last year, the advice was to really minimize the amount of gathering we were doing. Now we have uh, a certain percentage of the population that's vaccinated. Do you think that there will be a holiday surge uh, that's less severe than last year because of that? You know, it's hard to say, Zerlina, we'll have to see. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is going to be up to individuals. If you plan on having a celebration indoors uh, for Thanksgiving uh, or for uh, the uh, winter holidays, Christmas and Hanukkah and so on, I, uh, here's what we would do and what we are going to do is we're going to tell potential guests and we're not going to have a whole lot of them that you have to be vaccinated in order to come to the house here. And uh, I think the more people that uh, demand that uh, very basic uh, requirement that you get vaccinated before you come to an indoor gathering, the better off we're going to be. And those will be more incentives, I think, for people to get vaccinated. What's going to happen this year, I, I don't know. The trends are now going down, which is a good thing for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. But we're about to face the winter season, which may uh, increase the spread of the virus and the growth of the virus or the uh, development of more variants. We may, we may actually see that. We don't know yet. Um, and uh, we have to be vigilant and we have to pay attention to the reality that we're not done with COVID yet. <sighs> That's always so hard to hear because everybody wants this to be over with, but it's good to sort of manage your expectations according to the science. So kids now, five and up, finally are getting their chance to receive the vaccine. Um, what is your message to any parents out there who might be hesitant about getting their kid vaccinated? 
So let's first of all remember, Zelina, that uh, children receive, uh, you know, 10 or 15 vaccines by the time they're ready to go to school. And this vaccine has been tested in a quite a large number of uh, kids. The dose that uh, children will get and have been getting in the, in the uh, uh, tests that they've been doing to date is only one third of what the adult dose is. And uh, it's been very effective in terms of uh, children developing the immunity they need. And it's been very, very safe. Look, you want to give your kids the vaccine because we want to keep them from getting sick, obviously. But the second big thing is that we want to avoid any more school closures, which happen every single time uh, a child or a teacher uh, gets, uh, gets tested positive. And we can help keep our schools open, which is desperately needed in America. We can help keep our schools open by making sure that your kids are vaccinated. Um, and I, I think that's really the key message. It's safe, it's effective, and it'll help keep kids in school. I don't know what more we can possibly ask from any kind of strategy to deal with COVID than that. One of the things that I've, I've wondered since the beginning of the pandemic is why we're having such a hard time with rapid testing. I remember testing and contact tracing being, you know, terms that people are bringing up a lot in the beginning. But now, you know, there was reporting this week that rapid COVID tests are a lot more expensive in the United States than they are anywhere else. Do you have any insight into why that is and why uh, rapid tests, which are very helpful to have, are, are not more readily available to, to average American families who might want to have them around, but maybe they can't afford it? Yeah, well, if, first of all, if a test costs between $12 and $25 a pop, which is what it is, uh, and we're not getting enough government support to make it affordable, that's really a major disincentive for families. You were talking in the last segment about the crushing impact economically on, on families of the pandemic, and now we're going to go ask families to go ahead and spend this kind of money weekly for all members of their family. That's not fair, and it's not right, and I think there should be a lot more uh, government subsidization. Uh, for the testing, if that's where we're going to go. But we really should be heading not so much for just testing, but vaccines first. And I think that should be the first priority. Those should be free and accessible. And I think uh, that's what we're going to be uh, having to depend on even more than the testing, Zerlina. In terms of the light at the end of the tunnel, I hate that metaphor now because we kept saying it last year and then the Delta surge hit. And so obviously that was a poor... Uh, metaphor for what's happening. Um, but you mentioned the possibility of new variants. Are there any that you're tracking that you're concerned about? Or can we go back to saying that we're almost at the end of the tunnel? Well, what I've been saying all along here is that, yeah, there may be light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a very, very long tunnel. And it seems to keep getting longer with every new development of, and new variants. So People are tracking not only the Delta variant, but Delta Plus variant, Lambda variant. And then, of course, we have the problem of entire continents like Africa or Southeast Asia, where the vaccination rates are astoundingly low, like less than 10 percent for the entire continent of Africa. And that means that we have a lot of undetected variants uh, that may be fermenting and growing in places where there's very low vaccination rates. And ultimately, and f eventually, th almost all those variants will make their way to every other part of the world. So we're very far from being done with the uh, detection and management of the variants. And that's why we're get really in this for the long haul, which I'm, I I'm very sorry to say. It's, it's depressing. It's true. But that's why we have to keep fighting. And the optimism is that, as Fauci said today, the vaccines work. They work like crazy, and the mandates work. So those are the, those are the messages, those are the strategies that we have to keep pushing, and we can't let up. Even if we're completely sick of this pandemic, the way around this is to make sure we, we've pushed this vaccine as hard as we can. I'm definitely sick of this pandemic, but I know that um, I care more about keeping my family safe and myself safe. Um, so I'm going to do whatever is necessary, even if that means wearing a mask, which is not that bad, actually, uh, for like, you know, a really long time. Like people 
in other parts of the world, masking is normal uh, when you have the sniffles. So I don't, I don't really see a problem with that. Do you think that there are policies that the Biden administration could could implement or, or spearhead to help with that vaccination rate in, in the on the continent of Africa or in Southeast Asia? Is there more we could be doing as a country policy wise? Well, uh, you know, of course, the, the, if we had a Biden uh, administration representative with us, they would say that we are producing a lot of vaccine that we're going to be able to export uh, to places like uh, many of the countries in Africa. I think we need to accelerate that. I think we could afford to potentially double the output, and uh, that's what we should be focused on for those countries. Dr. Irwin Redletter, it's always great to talk to you, um, even though it's during this pandemic, but it's helpful to have you so we can figure out how to keep ourselves safe. Thank you, as always, for being here. Please stay safe. Coming up, former President Trump's attempt to block the release of White House documents linked to January 6th and the insurrection seems to have hit a bit of a roadblock. Plus, questions surrounding the selection of an almost entirely white jury in the trial in the killing of Ahmed Arbery. We'll be right back. We have breaking news into the investigations of the former President Donald Trump. According to the Washington Post, the Manhattan District Attorney has convened a new grand jury for its criminal investigation into the Trump Organization. This also seems to be a separate issue from the one in the indictments from the first grand jury. Are you keeping up? Meanwhile, at the federal level, there is a hearing today on whether to block releasing Trump's documents to the House January 6th Select Committee. These documents include a draft of the former president's speech for the rally that preceded the attack, a memo about possibly suing states that President Joe Biden actually won, and talking points about alleged election irregularities in a county in the state of Michigan. The federal judge who heard today's case questioned Trump's claim of executive privilege and his refusal to provide the necessary information to the committee. When the former president's legal team argued the committee's request for the documents were invalid because they're unrelated to congressional legislation, the judge said, and I quote, the January 6th riot happened in the Capitol. That is literally Congress's house. I'm glad somebody finally said that. Joining me now is Glenn Kirshner. He is an NBC News legal analyst and a former federal prosecutor. And I said that sort of jokingly, but honestly, it was a little bit refreshing uh, to hear. But I want to start um, with the Manhattan DA news, because that actually broke right uh, as we were getting ready to go on air today. What does it what does it mean that there's a second grand jury looking into the Trump organization's financial practices? What do we know about this grand jury and how it's different from the first one? You know, I think the big question, Zerlina, is this a procedural thing or is it a substantive thing? Because remember, the last special grand jury that was impaneled was impaneled for six months, which is unusual in the state of New York. Usually grand juries are impaneled only for about a month or six weeks. So that was unusual. And that signaled that Cy Vance and his prosecutors probably wanted some consistency over a six-month period so they could present um, evidence before that grand jury. So now that there's a second grand jury coming, it could be that the six-month grand jury is expiring and they want to impanel another special grand jury. So it could be procedural. Sometimes, though, there are issues when you present evidence to one grand jury and you then do not want the grand jury to consider some of that information. Sometimes you will begin presenting evidence to a second grand jury, untainted, so to speak, by anything the hmm. earlier grand jury might have heard. But right now, I think we're reading tea leaves as to whether this is a procedural second grand jury or a substantive second grand jury. I don't know about you, but it feels like trying to hold Trump accountable is very complicated. There's all kinds of grand juries. There's special prosecutors. There is a lot of things happening just to hold this one person accountable and his organization for alleged wrongdoing. Um, and hopefully they won't need like 10 grand juries to be able to do it. Um, I want to turn to the federal hearing um, related to the January 6th insurrection. And you tweeted that you tried cases against 
uh, the federal judge when she was a public defender. Um, what can you tell us about her? Zerlina, I can tell you that she is strong. She is fierce. She is fearless. She was a really good public defender because she fought hard, but she fought fair. And she was one of the uh, defense attorneys that you could have a really nice relationship with outside the court because she was very civil and cordial. Um, and when I saw her today on the bench, it's probably the first time I've been in a courtroom with her for a couple of decades. But it was the, the Judge Chutkin that I remember from our days angling in Superior Court trying murder cases against one another. She, um, you know, she kicked through every argument Trump's lawyer, a guy named Justin Clark, made, and she just dismantled his arguments. For example, he said, well, Your Honor, this is a dispute between the branches of government. Judge Chutkin said, no, excuse me, because the executive branch, as represented by President Biden, and the legislative branch, as represented by the House Select Committee, are in agreement that these materials should be turned over to the House Select Committee so we can get to the bottom of the Capitol attack. And she added, this may be, be one of the rare instances that the branches of government are actually in harmony. So what do you got next, Mr. Clark? And then argument by argument, you know, he said, well, this will um, harm Donald Trump if these materials are released. She said, well, excuse me, um, how will he be harmed? And the attorney backtracked and said, well, the office of the presidency will be harmed. She said, really, who makes the decision as to whether the office of the presidency will be harmed under the, um, pres the, the Presidential Records Act? And he had to say, um, the current president. May and how has mm -hmm. Joe Biden decided that issue? He decided that these materials should be released in the public interest. OK, next and argument after argument. He finally said, well, you know what, Judge, you should personally have to review every single document, every one of the thousands of documents and decide whether each document should be disclosed or not disclosed. And she said, other than slowing the process to a snail's pace, Mr. Clark, what would that accomplish? And Mr. Clark had bupkis. So I suspect we're going to see a very quick, very definitive ruling against Donald Trump in favor of the release of these materials. Then the big ticket question becomes, is there an appeal? And do the courts allow the documents to go over during the pendency of the appeal, perhaps with some kind of a limiting or protective order? Or do they put a stop to it all and let Donald Trump weaponize the delay in the process. Yeah, that's my last question, which is, you know, the deadline's coming up on November 12th for the first batch of documents to be released to the House committee. Do you think that there's another shenanigan or, you know, thing he, rabbit he could pull out of his hat to delay this from happening, the legal team? With Donald Trump, there are always more shenanigans lurking around the corner. But he, I, I am hoping that the court has learned its lesson and will not be used by a nefarious litigant who wants to run out the clock, who knows he has no winning argument uh, on the merits. He has a losing argument, but he wants to delay, delay, delay until the narrative changes or the clock is run out. Now, I think Judge Chutkin, who set this hearing at light speed, and I suspect will issue a ruling at light speed, she is not letting Donald Trump get away with it. Let's hope that the appellate court takes the same approach as Judge Chutkin. Len Kirshner, it's always great to have you to help us understand all that's going on because this is actually unprecedented, a lot of it. Um, thank you very much for being here, as always. Stay safe. This week, there are three trials going on in three different states, and all of those trials are centered on the issue of race. In Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse stands trial for killing two Black Lives Matter protesters and wounding another. In Virginia, the civil trial is trial is underway against neo-Nazi and white nationalist groups responsible for organizing the violent Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And in Georgia, opening statements could begin tomorrow for the three white men on trial for the murder of Ahmed Arbery, a black man who was out jogging. So with race and racism at the forefront of these three trials, it's a little shocking that after two weeks of jury selection in Georgia, only one solitary juror of the 12 jurors 
is black. Just think about that. Just sit and think about that for a moment. Does an almost entirely white jury seem a bit deliberate to you? Well, the judge presiding over the trial seems to think so. This court has found that there appears to be uh, intentional uh, discrimination in the panel. So the judge seems to think the makeup of the, this jury might have been intentional. But he says he won't reseat the jury because the defense provided, quote, legitimate reasons to excuse eight potential black jurors. And, you know, all of this, all of it just makes me think about another jury. An all white, all male jury who in 1955 acquitted the two white men accused of killing Emmett Till, a 14 year old black boy. Here we are, 66 years later. And I'm honestly wondering how much has really changed. Joining me now is MSNBC legal analyst, Danny Savalos. And Danny, as a defense attorney, what were the objections to the eight potential black jurors? It was my understanding from law school, you actually can't reject jurors because of their race, right? You can't, but the challenge in Batson, and I myself have been Batsoned or re reverse Batsoned uh, in trials, it, the challenge with Batson is that, yes, in theory, it's unconstitutional to exclude jurors based on their race. But how do you find out? Uh, when you get Batsoned as a lawyer, you look at your notes, and whatever you've written on your notes, you tell the judge, oh, you know, I didn't like the way that guy was looking at my client or some other reason. Now, and you should always give honest reasons, but you can see how easy it is as long as you can, uh, an attorney can come up with some non-discriminatory reason to exclude that juror, then the uh, use of that peremptory challenge is presumably okay. So Batson uh, is criticized as a fix to a problem, but a problem that may not be able to be fixed because as with all things racial, they often lie under the surface. Mm -hmm. It's such a good point. It's really hard to prove this kind of thing sometimes. And nearly 27% of the county where the trial is taking, pla uh, taking place in Glynn County uh, is black. And that seems to me one of the reasons why the all-white jur jury saved this one black juror um, seems out of whack. Is, is, is that in any way grounds for appeal, something that can be brought up later, or is this this prosecution team stuck with this all white jury with one black person in this crime that really mirrors so many we've seen throughout history? The mere fact that the ultimate jury seated may all be of one race is not automatically unconstitutional. For example, you can think of population areas where there really is all of one race. Uh, an example, I try cases in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's not unusual to have a jury that is 100 percent black or you know, West Indian. So you, it really depends on where you're trying the case. However, there is a constitutional right to what's called a fair cross section of the community, not in the ultimate jury that is seated, but in the folks that are called in to serve. So that is the constitutional guarantee. And of course, the other uh, racial check is the Batson challenge so that it's a strange thing. You can end up with an all white jury, as long as you didn't use uh, racial discrimination to arrive at that all white jury. Do you think it's odd that the judge acknowledged that there was intentional discrimination, but then also determined that he didn't want to reseat the jury? Help us understand that, how he said one thing and then did another thing. Yeah, that was the really bizarre thing to me is that, look, when there's a Batson challenge, the judge can either accept the reasoning or deny the reasoning. The judge can say, look, I know you said that this particular juror gave your client funny looks or they looked like they were dozing off or you gave all these non-discriminatory reasons. But guess what? I don't believe them. Uh, you cannot exclude this juror. He didn't do that. Apparently, whatever the Batson challenges were, he presided over them. And then after the fact, he appears to be saying that uh, I think there may have been discrimination here. Yeah, but that's discrimination on your watch, Your Honor. So uh, I don't know if he's trying to set up a preservation for an appealable issue, but it's not really his role to make that record. Hmm. One of the other questions I have about this, Judge, is, I mean, there's been debate about really his impartiality. I mean, we're talking about a court in Georgia 
Um, let's be honest about it. We've seen an all-white jury be seated. Um, is there a risk that this is not necessarily going to be completely fair without adequate resource, re, uh, recourse after the fact? I mean, if we go through this trial and this mostly white jury acquits these men who are on video doing this, I'm not saying that they should, they should be, have the full trial, have the full defense, um, but there's video, right? So I think as observers and uh, Americans, I'm concerned with there being no recourse because the judges have so much discretion. Is that an issue the prosecution um, can bring up later because of the strange decisions this judge is making so far? Well, that is the imbalance in our criminal justice system. If the defense loses, they can appeal. If the prosecution uh, loses, if there's an acquittal, there are no comebacks. That is game over, yeah. no appeals. Your client stands up, they take the cuffs off, he walks. So, uh, yes, yep. the prosecution, in a sense, has more to lose here. I think that's an important point. I feel like I should have known that from law and order or law school, but I, I think law it was school. helpful for the audience to understand. <laughs> I know, but it was important for the audience to understand that because I think, like, when they see the judge making these decisions, they're like, wait, is there any recourse at all? And I think it's important to understand your point that the prosecution doesn't have any recourse. They just have to try to go out and prove it beyond a, beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, <laughs> Danny Savalos, you're the best. I always love talking to you about the law, even when I rem forgot half of it from law school. Danny Savalos, again, thank you. Coming up, could Texas's abortion ban be coming to a state legislature near you? I'll talk to a Texas lawmaker about copycat bills being introduced around the country. We'll be right back. I am followed into my job. I am screamed at. My child is screamed at by people that purport to love children. I get hate messages and death threats to my home simply for caring for my community. So it's very disturbing for me personally to hear people proclaim to be pro-life while they actively threaten my life and my child's life. That was an obstetrician and gynecologist, a child of Iranian immigrants, a very accomplished doctor who has devoted her entire career to providing the full spectrum of reproductive health care. And that includes abortion for the people in Texas. She is an abortion provider, and today she spoke before the House Judiciary Committee about the devastating impact the new Texas abortion law is having on communities and families, including her own. The Texas law is basically an outright ban on abortions. It seeks a, it prohibits abortion after six weeks, way before many people even know they're pregnant. But the most shocking part of the law is that it's enforced by private citizens who can sue anyone who provides or assists in an abortion. Oh, and they get a $10,000 bounty if they win the case. The Texas doctor you just heard from says her own child has been intimidated by these empowered vigilantes. And that's not going to end anytime soon. Republicans across the country are racing to copy the bill in their own states. Florida did it already. And on Tuesday, Ohio lawmakers introduced an even more extreme bill that bans all abortions. Arkansas, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Indiana are also taking notes. Lawmakers in those states are gearing up to introduce similar laws. So where the heck does this end? How many more people have to be intimidated? or lives put in danger for lawmakers to stop this assault on reproductive rights. And joining us to discuss is Democratic Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Absolutely, it's great to see you. Representative Crockett, before we talk about abortion, we have some breaking news. The Justice Department is suing Texas over new voting restrictions. What's your reaction to that news? <laughs> Um, you know, I was really excited to find out that they were doing that, but um, I'm disappointed at the same time because of this thing called the filibuster. I don't know if you've heard of it or if your viewers have heard of it, um, but it is blocking us from having real change that we need in this country. It's blocking us from having voting rights um, restored in this country. We know that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was completely gutted. I shouldn't say completely, but basically was completely gutted um, years ago. And so now we've gone through redistricting with these crazy right-wing legislatures that are absolutely cheating so that they can maintain power or ascertain additional power 
in addition to the fact that we needed preclearance, which we would be provided under the Voting Rights Advancement Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, as it's been presented um, this go round, we also needed to get HR1 or S1, anything passed that would establish some baseline for what each state would be allowed. And so this idea that we're suing is great, or I shouldn't say we, we're being sued. Um, the idea that the lawsuit is taking place is a great idea in theory. Um, but is it going to get us what all we need? Probably not, because you still have to have legislation. You still have to have guidance from the court. And so something is better than nothing, but it would be nice if we didn't have to deal with the filibuster or two senators that claim to be Democrats that continually uh, block great Democratic policies that are supported by the majority of Americans. I mean, one of the things, I mean, and of course, the, the folks who watch this show, they know what the filibuster is because we say that almost <laughs> every day. Um, but, but to that point, you know, one of the things I think a lot about is, you know, I understand sort of Joe Manchin, maybe you're more moderate and you're like, I don't want all this spending and here are my reasons and, you know, here are my ideas for, you know, giving voters less than what they're actually saying they want because, to your point, polling majority support. Um, but on the, the issue of voting rights, I don't understand why you would not be in support of at least reforming the filibuster for that vote. Do you have any insight into why he or Kirsten Cinema? don't even want to change the filibuster for that vote because that actually doesn't it's not a policy position it's like we want to preserve tradition or something I, I there's not really a coherent argument for that that position on the filibuster I, I have no idea and there are those that say well if we do this then what will re what will the republicans do when they're in power let me tell you something if we don't do this first of all they will be in power um, and they will cheat most likely to get it. But second of all, it doesn't matter. They always cheat. The reason that the Supreme Court looks the way that it looks is because they change the rules of the game to fit whatever their agenda is at that time. That is why we have this very conservative court. We had seats that were stolen when it came to the Supreme Court. So this idea that we don't want to do it because they may do it to us is just lacking all courage as far as I'm concerned. And I think that there is nothing more important than voting rights. So I've been disappointed that infrastructure has completely derailed voting rights because at the end of the day, the infrastructure of our democracy is at risk. And it doesn't seem like it's an urgent matter. And so when we look at a state like Virginia and we look at those losses, I see backlash from DC. But one thing that people understand is they understand that voting rights are under attack and they may not have necessarily been under attack specifically in Virginia, but they see that this is what's going on in our country. We have bills right now that we're going through. We had over 200 bills, in fact, that went through so many legislatures where they were really trying to roll back the hands of time to pre-1965. Mm -hmm. Yet we want to focus on and say that the urgent thing is infrastructure, this thing that nobody can really describe. And so the average voter doesn't really understand what it is that they're pushing for, but they do know right now abortion and reproductive rights are under attack. They absolutely know that we are under attack when it comes to voting rights. And so the fact that we're not dealing with these very basic things that were guaranteed to us decades ago is a problem. Yeah, as you heard in, in the opening sound, you know, people are being threatened. Abortion providers are being threatened. And to your point, um, many of these things are, I, I don't know, I, I feel like they are a bigger priority, like voting and climate. Being able to breathe and live and vote to be able to affect, you know, the kind of policies in a democracy that every citizen has the right to do. That seems pretty simple to me. Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett, thank you so much for joining us tonight. In many ways, it's not even a partisan point. That's just a democracy point. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.